Well, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, as uh, a president of the association, I, I wanted to, to join Teresa in uh, thanking uh, the Universidad de Girona for the support of the symposio, and in particular the uh, the two committees, the, the scientific committee that was chaired by Vicente Cuñat, and also the local organizing committee, uh, especially Dulos Verga uh, and Renan Goetz, who has taken care of the job market. And uh, we are really delighted to be here, and the organization is fantastic. Uh, so uh, we're really grateful to the, to the department and to these people. So, uh, without further ado, let, let me uh, start with my talk. Okay, so um, this is a joint work with uh, Jose Ignacio Garcia Perez and Marcel Janssen. And so we have embarked in this project on uh, looking at labor, uh, labor market in Spain, in particular long-term unemployment, which we think is a, is a big uh, problem right now. Uh, let me start by saying that I uh, should give the copyright of the title, which is a bit provocative, to my co-author and friend, Jill St. Paul, who had a paper in 1996 that was called are the unemployed unemployable? So we're just looking at a specific country and a specific group, uh, which we think is a very important group right now. And I'm going to organize my presentation uh, in uh, five questions. One is uh, the effect of the Great Recession on long-term unemployment. Then what are the sources of this increase that we have seen in long-term unemployment? Uh, then uh, short look at whether uh, reservation wages do adjust uh, to long-term unemployment, to, to duration, actually. Then what are the determinants of becoming a long-term unemployed and uh, then leaving long-term unemployment? And finally, uh, some policy recommendations, uh, hopefully derived from the evidence that we have uh, found. Let me give you since we are short on time, a uh, sneak preview of the main findings. Uh, I wrote there that they are preliminary because they are. Unfortunately, they are more preliminary than I uh, expected to, to have at this point. But as you know, when you embark on empirical projects, uh, the data don't always want to confess. Uh, and you have to torture them uh, so that they do. And uh, we've done that for quite a number of weeks uh, and very intensely in the past few weeks. But uh, the main uh, findings are, well, the Great Recession has created an enormous buildup of long-term unemployed and also very long-term unemployed. And the composition of uh, the unemployed comparing the long-term with the short-term has worsened uh, uh, you know, against uh, the long-term unemployed, but uh, it has been moderate, and in fact, it seems to uh, have uh, corrected in the, in the, at the end of the recession. And the, but the main uh, cause of this uh, shift in composition is uh, uh, duration dependence. Then we look at uh, entry wages, so the wages that the unemployed get when they when they find a new job, and these have been really falling quite uh, dramatically over the recession. And this is quite new uh, for Spain. And, and then we look at whether uh, workers really adjust to this. And it turns out that they do adjust. But uh, at least in 2011, which is what we can look at at this stage, uh, in terms of intentions, it doesn't really adjust uh, enough. Then uh, the main part of the presentation, or the most original, I guess, is the determinants of uh, entering unemployment and leaving unemployment. Uh, and that is going to depend, as you will see, the probability of being a long-term unemployed is going to depend mostly on having unemployment benefits, on low skills, mature age, and low experience. And then the, the last part is going to be that the uh, we think that just 
the recovery in output and aggregate demand that we are fortunately seeing now is probably not going to be enough to reduce uh, long-term unemployment to uh, the extent that is really needed. Uh, so other things need to be done, and we're going to focus on uh, active labor market policies. So uh, I start with uh, the facts, but let me just introduce a topic with a few figures which I find really staggering. Uh, these refer to the last data point we have, which is the third quarter of this year. So we have 4.85 million people unemployed, according to the Labor for Survey. Uh, this means that, that the unemployment rate is 21%, roughly, which is very high. Uh, then we have almost 3 million long-term unemployed. That's unemployed for more than one year. And that's going to be the terminology I'm going to use. And uh, two, almost 2.2 million who are very long-term unemployed. That's unemployed for more than two years. Uh, so that, this means that 61% of the unemployed are long-term, and 45% almost are very long-term. So these are really very high figures. And from the uh, exercises I'm going to show you uh, later on, you will see uh, some, some numbers that come from that exercise is that uh, if someone, this is a specific case for men, uh, and we estimate this for the recession and early recovery. Uh, if someone is a long-term unemployed, if a man is long-term unemployed, the probability of being a very long-term unemployed is one half. So that's really quite dramatic. And it's even, even more so if someone reaches two years in, in unemployment, the probability of reaching three years is 68%. So that's, again, even more worrying. Uh, so uh, that's something to, to think about. Uh, so this is a standard and sorry uh, figure. This is the unemployment rate in Spain, which, as we know, is a structural problem. Uh, this is the third time since we have data that we've reached 20% uh, and gone over 20% of an, as an unemployment rate overall. And uh, as you can see there, we have the, the recessions. That as dated by the Spanish Economic Association uh, Dating Committee. And I think someone should pick up on them and challenge them because, you know, they don't find that there was a recession in the 80s. And I find that uh, uh, startling. So I should like to, for, uh, you know, produce, people produce some uh, research on this uh, as a way also of uh, publicizing this output of the Spanish Economic uh, Association. So, as you can see, the build-up has been very high uh, during the Great Recession. And uh, some numbers, I'm going to go very fast because I don't have much time, but uh, as you can see, well, the participation rate didn't really uh, change much. It, it increased a bit, but it, the, the uh, group for which it really fell was young people. It really felt quite... Uh, quite a lot, but in the other groups it's been quite uh, stable or even increasing in some groups. What has really fallen dramatically is the employment rate. So the employment divided by working age population, this has really fallen quite a lot and is quite homogeneous across different groups. And the other uh, outcome that is really staggering is the increase in unemployment from 8% to now 21%, but it did reach uh, a quarter, above a quarter. Uh, so that's not uh, uh, a great recession, but, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, 1929 uh, in the U.S. Uh, so, and what we've seen is it has increased a lot for m most for men, for young workers, uh, and for low education workers, those are the, the patterns that, that we find. But if you now decompose unemployment by the time in, in unemployment, you see that the short-term unemployed well, follows the standard pattern. People from one to two years unemployed uh, follows a similar pattern with uh, some delay. What is really uh, most surprising here is that the very long term unemployed, so more than two years, uh, it has a delay, uh, 
and uh, it, it takes a while to fall. And in the Great Recession, it has really shot up much faster than the others. And now we are the second time in history since we have records. The other one was in the, in the mid-'80s, where there are more people who are long -term, very long-term unemployed than short-term unemployed, because short-term unemployment has to do with churning, with uh, job creation and destruction, uh, but this is a more structural problem. So this is, in a nutshell, what we are facing. Uh, who are the long-term unemployed? Here we've made this more dramatic. The short-term is really what they call short-term in the U.S. That's people up to six months compared to the very long-term, more than two years. And really what we find is uh, uh, is not... Uh, here we have the share of employment, the share of short-term unemployed, and the shares of long-term unemployed by groups. So each of these uh, blocks would add up to 100. And what you can see is that uh, uh, is more uh, prevalent among men, slightly, but uh, it's really more prevalent um, among prime age and mature workers here than uh, the, uh, the uh, low educated have higher shares than their shares in, in employment. And then uh, across sectors, there are some differences, but if you compare with employment, you see uh, an effect really here from con uh, construction is now 6% but is 17% of the long-term unemployed, so there's another effect there. Of course, we know that the Great Recession was caused by, apart from the worldwide shock, by the collapse of the housing bubble, so that hit construction workers, low-skilled workers, uh, and, as we'll see, uh, older workers and workers with less experience, and, but this has to do with uh, temporary contracts, which really caused the very fast build-up of unemployment uh, in Spain. So those are more or less the factors behind this, this uh, recession. And uh, uh, more evidence on this, you see construction falling really dramatically when we compare the end of the boom to, to today, and then also a fall in uh, basically real estate and an increase in the other sectors, particularly in professional business services. And uh, the last piece of broad evidence that I want to show is a comparison with uh, other countries where we are really an outlier. This is uh, the share in the labor force in long-term unemployment, again, the end of the, the boom and, and, and 2014. And you can see this tremendous increase in long-term unemployment, uh, now above uh, like 12% where, you know, we're only comparable to, to Greece, which suffered a much higher fall in output. So uh, there's really something going on here, uh, which has to do with, uh, with the structure of a labor market. But uh, not, not many people are really talking about this in Europe. So I think uh, this should be a more active area of research. Whereas, surprisingly, it's more of a of an issue in the U.S., there's a bunch of uh, people doing lots of papers on long-term unemployment, which in the U.S., as I said, is six, more than six months. And, uh, I mean, it wouldn't register here because well, almost, I mean, it's 2% of the labor force, but still they're worried. So I think we should be, even be more worried than, than they are, a lot more. Uh, and why do we care about long-term unemployment? Well, it has lots of persistence. Uh, the long-term unemployed become disenfranchised from the labor force, they lose skills, they exert low search effort uh, because they are discouraged, and they suffer stigma. Firms don't want them because they think they're going to be worse workers just due to the time they've been uh, unemployed. And so this can really create hysteresis, a, a short-term shock, lack of demand, can become a long-term situation of structural unemployment because there is a lot of persistence. So that's why we really should care a lot about this. And in, in, in the Spanish case, as I'll show you, people who had not been in, uh, in long-term unemployment before, people with standard labor careers, not just people who have really 
important problems of employability are now in that situation. So this is really becoming too widespread and this creates social and economic exclusion, physical and mental health problems and our institutions, especially in this country, I think are not very well equipped to help the long-term unemployed to, to find jobs. Uh, and there are then wider issues of sustainability of the social welfare system. So what are the sources? And the literature here has debated uh, hotly whether this is, uh, you know, the buildup of long-term unemployed is uh, the uh, consequence of the characteristics of the unemployed or there is duration dependence, whether really being in unemployment has uh, 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 an effect on duration, so people tend to uh, persist in unemployment once you control for the characteristics. And uh, the, the debate is not settled yet, and some people will still argue that there's no duration dependence. Uh, some people will argue that there is, so uh, it's, it's hard to really measure uh, accurately and uh, without dispute. Uh, so what do we do? The first thing we do, uh, one thing that's uh, different in, this, uh, in our work from other papers is that we're not going to focus on, we're not going to really use the data I've been showing you so far, so we're a bit schizophrenic. We're not going to focus on the labor first survey. We're going to focus on this other alternative source, the Muestra Continua Vidas Laborales, this uh, longitudinal working life sample, uh, which is a 4% random sample of workers in the social security system. It has some very important advantages vis-a-vis -vis the labor force survey. It has some very important disadvantages versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the labor force survey. So, so far we've used this source. Uh, we plan uh, to check our findings to the extent we can with the labor force survey. Uh, but uh, it's going to be limited because the, the, the survey has also limitations in tracking, especially the long-term unemployed, okay? So what we've done is to, uh, uh, well, first, I've been misusing the word unemployment because we cannot really, with this, with this uh, sample, we cannot really talk about unemployment, uh, strictly speaking, because workers are, in, in this data set, as long as they have a relationship with the social security system, and this is roughly when they are employed or when they are employed, sorry, where they're unemployed, getting benefits. And then if they stop getting benefits, except for some special cases, they would drop from the sample. Uh, so what we're going to do is to consider them to still be unemployed, uh, as long as they don't go back to a job. But then, this is not really the labor force survey definition of unemployment, so we're going to restrict the sample to uh, make sure that we're not committing uh, big errors in calling these people unemployed. We should be calling them non-employed, okay? But uh, we're going to, to, make this, to take this license. So we're restricting to people from 25 to 54. So we're leaving out the young who are unstable in the relationship with the labor market. We're leaving out the old who might be starting to think of uh, uh, retirement. We are going to take away job-to-job -job moves, which are incredibly frequent because of these temporary contracts. So any job with, uh, of any duration of less than 15 days, we don't consider as unemployment. And then we're going to keep people only on a, when they are employed for, for three years. And then we don't know if they really should be called unemployed or not, so we are being cautious there. And, and then on the wage side, we, we have a problem. I mean, the labor force survey doesn't have wages. This source has wages, which is a big advantage, but it's top-coded because the wages are really the base on which the social security contributions are uh, uh, lifted, uh, taxed, and so there is, uh, by law, there is a, a top code. And therefore, we're going to only be uh, looking at people from the fifth percentile to the 90th percentile. We're leaving the other ones out as, as a way to also uh, reduce measurement error. 
Uh, so what we, the first exercise is to estimate the wage equation, very standard, controlling uh, only for employees, controlling for age and age square, education, experience and age square, occupation, industry, province. And this follows a similar exercise for the U.S. by Kruger, Kramer, and Cho. Uh, we separately estimate for men and women because their uh, coefficients look uh, significantly different. So what we do is we estimate this equation for 2005, and then we sort of uh, impute or we predict what would be the wages of these people if they were in the market, uh, so if they had a job, to have a measure of their market value or, you know, uh, uh, in some sense. And then we carry this out until 2013. We don't use 2014 because at that point there are too many censored spells and, uh, and we think we might be having a big co uh, composition uh, effect. So uh, this is the first result. Uh, this is the, the predicted wage for the long-term unemployed and this is one for the short-term unemployed. And typically the long-term unemployed have high predicted wages because they're typically older, more experienced, more skilled. Uh, and so they have uh, a high, typically have a higher market value, more expectations. Uh, they particularly have, also have higher financial resources. And therefore, they have a higher wage uh, than the short term. Uh, but the, the other thing you can see here what we want to focus on is the difference between this predicted wage, which starts very stable, and this is the height. Uh, this is in logs. I don't know anyone who can think in logs, okay? So uh, it would be a very weird person if, if, if someone did. So uh, this is about, uh, these, are, these are not very high values. Uh, these are averages, of course. This is like uh, 1,400 euros, and this is about, uh, there is like, uh, 1,300 euros, so the, this gap is about 100 euros per month, so it's not really very large, but, but it's there and it's significant. And what you can see is that this really, the, the quality of the long-term unemployed falls vis-a-vis -vis the short-term unemployed. That would mean that they would have uh, more difficulty in, in uh, rejoining the labor market, but, you know, it's still true, I guess, in 2011-12, but then it uh, widens up. So this seems to uh, be first moderate and then seems to be sort of self-correcting. This is the, uh, the difference, and the difference is like three percentage points, so it's not that large, but it did fall to 1%. And uh, the one thing that seems to be behind this evolution is that uh, uh, the, uh, it's really happening there. You know, the, the, this recession was very long, but it had some recovery, one year of recovery in the middle. And it seems that uh, the, I, I guess, there was a large buildup of short-term unemployed with high quality. And then there is duration dependence, so these people eventually move up there. And, and that's why I, I guess this uh, is stable or even increasing. So this doesn't seem, the composition doesn't seem to be a huge problem. Uh, for women, we find some results which are unexpected. The short term seem to have a higher or a higher predicted wages than the long term. And then the opposite, as happens to men, uh, in, happens. We really have to look at this carefully uh, uh, yet. Okay. So I will be mostly focusing on, on men in my talk. First, because of time, and second, because we are also finding a results for women that uh, uh, we don't fully understand uh, yet. So, second point is uh, wages. Uh, so, in Spain, is characterized by relatively low, uh, what is called real wage flexibility. This is the re uh, response of wages, of real wages to unemployment. And, uh, uh, in uh, other countries, estimates of uh, this semi-elasticity, so that's what is the change in the real wage for a one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate. And in the, in the U.S. and in other Western European countries, this is typically above one. 
Now, uh, although you know there has been a very long, very very long history of debate of on real wage flexibility, some people were arguing at the macro level that it was very low. Then, when we started having micro data, we found that it's higher, and it's typically higher for job movers. But in Spain, a recent paper by Font, Izquierdo, and Puente find that uh, it is low in recession, low in expansion, but it's even lower in recession in expansion, which is the opposite that you need to really preserve employment. So, and when when you know these two estimates for the expansion is low unemployment, high. Uh, uh, High unemployment, low unemployment. So when unemployment goes down in an expansion, we just become more responsive. So it's exactly what you wouldn't want to have to to uh, have lower unemployment. And uh, uh, it seems to have uh, it really it is really higher for job movers. These people who are on temporary jobs and move for people who find uh, who lose a job and then find a temporary job, which is 90% of the inflow or more they do get uh, lower wages, so the sensitivity is higher. And there seems to be a couple of these authors also find that for a short period after the labor reform, it seems to have gone up, okay, which I think is good news. Uh, so we do essentially the same exercise that we, I just showed you for, uh, for wages in 2005, but for the first job that people find, uh, when they are unemployed and then they find a job, the first complete month of employment, this is like uh, the initial wage or the re-entry wage, what does that look like to see uh, uh, what is the, uh, the, the price at which uh, people are finding new jobs? And uh, again, it's the same uh, groups and everything as, as before. We take away entrance in our, in our age Bracket, really, there are not that many entrants. Uh, so this is, the, this is the outcome. This is for men. And as you can see, they move, uh, actually, wages were increasing. Then they move parallel during the first part of the Great Recession. But then they, after 2009, where there was this huge buildup of unemployment, reserve, I mean, entry wages really started to fall quite dramatically. So the gap between what people were getting before and what they managed to get to re-enter the market really increased a lot. Uh, this was for the short term. It's uh, even bigger for the long term. Uh, this is the difference. And as you can see, there's not, at least so far, we don't find such a big difference between uh, these gaps between old wages and new wages between the long term and the short term, which is our focus. But what you can see is really it was falling and then start increasing mildly in 2010, but then quite uh, starkly. And now it's about 30, 32%. So that's a, a huge uh, wage cut to take, uh, controlling to some extent for characteristics. Uh, for women, this is uh, even more pronounced, both for the short term and for the long term. And uh, here you see the same evolution. It falls more. Here it starts, uh, it reaches uh, trough, this gap earlier. But then it increases, and by the end of the second recession, it's even higher than for men. It's about 33, 35%. Okay. But still, those values are, are similar and quite uh, large. So uh, are the unemployed really realizing that uh, things are not what they used to be? Yes, uh, they are realizing that. So we use another source, the Encuesta Financiera de las Familias, which uh, is exceptional because it has, apart from labor market characteristics, it has uh, information on wealth. And this is stratified, so it actually oversamples richer people, and is very carefully done. It, it has also one question which is very useful for us, uh, which is the unemployed are asked, at what gross monthly wage would you be willing to work? And one of the answers that's allowed to give is at any wage. Okay, so I'm really desperate. Uh, so this is even more preliminary than what I showed you, but uh, 
We did this for the 2011 wave. The sample is much smaller than for the other exercises. We have about 1,000 observations. So we pull men and women, and uh, we control so far for small sample characteristics. For example, we we're not controlling yet for wealth, uh, which is there. So this will certainly change when we do the exercise more carefully. But let me just show you what we find. There is an effect of the characteristics in the way you would expect, but the two important ones is getting benefits does raise, raise the wage that people uh, say they would require to, to take a job. And there is an effect of duration, so people are reducing their uh, reservation wage with duration. Uh, but this is in years, so one maybe a bit uh, well, risky but let me do it. Uh, risk interpretation would be that uh, it's about, you know, uh, benefits compensate for, for about one and a half years of unemployment. So people are reacting relatively slowly to, to this situation. And uh, when we run an exercise for answering any wage vis-a-vis -vis some level of the wage, uh, we find in effect that uh, duration does raise the likelihood that somebody will say that he's or she is willing to work for any wage. Okay, the benefits here are, uh, don't seem to be significant uh, at this stage. So people are adjusting, but uh, well, of course, this is not 2013, 14, where uh, unfortunately there are many more people in, in a dramatic situation. So. Uh, when we get the next wave of the EFF, we'll probably find new, new effects. But I think we, we might be able to get this for, for the previous wave and, and compare this over time. Uh, so uh, the last part of my talk is probability of entering and leaving unemployment, especially long-term unemployment. So here what we do is uh, analyze what is called I mean, this is a bit ironic, but it's called the hazard of living unemployment. You know, you are at risk of having this very bad situation of being able to leave unemployment. Uh, but that's the, the terminology. So we estimate three hazards. One is moving from being unemployed to being an employee. Second one is from being uh, an employee to being unemployed. And the third one, because it's, it's become so prevalent, is... Uh, moving from one job to another job. So what we do is we estimate these uh, three hazards together with, uh, with the techniques that have been used by Raquel Carrasco and one of us, uh, Jose Ignacio Garcia Perez, in a recent paper. So we treat duration as a, as a discrete uh, event, and uh, the hazard is really the probability of uh, a spell being completed conditional on still being in unemployment uh, one month before. And we make this depend on uh, uh, unemployment benefits and a uh, long list of characteristics I will tell you in a minute. But one important thing is that the employment equations do distinguish, which I will not have time to present, do distinguish between uh, temporary and permanent jobs. And eventually we, we might even want to estimate the different equations there, but uh, uh, at least everything is in, uh, many things are interact, interacted to have different effects. And uh, another feature of the estimation is that uh, we have several spells per person. We are looking at the period of 2001 to 2014, so that those are many years and we have the monthly evolution, so we exploit this feature, and we are allowing for an observed heterogeneity. So we we allow them all to have two types of unemployed people, two types of employed people. So in fact, we have a two by two uh, uh, measures of this an observed heterogeneity, a la uh, Heckman and Singer, and uh, we are controlling for uh, apart from allowing this which is estimated jointly with all the situations, employment and employment. Uh, there is a baseline hazard on duration, which is going to be 
the main component of the duration dependence. Then we have uh, unemployment benefits, unemployment benefits time duration, age and its square, experience, skill. Skill is really measured badly here because there are just three types. This is based on the occupations in this data set. So essentially we have uh, low skill, middle skill, and high skill. Uh, and uh, at this stage we're not using education because uh, it's not clear that it's uh, so well measured. Uh, we have to think whether we want to do that. We're controlling for industry and then whether the job separation was a dismissal. And then we're, since everything is conditional month by month, we are allowing for different uh, effects of the variables after 12 months, so focusing on long-term unemployment, and even in one variable, apart from the constant, in benefits after 24 months, so very long-term unemployed. And then we are including uh, aggregate variables, which are basically the growth rate of uh, employment in the province, the national employment rate, and then a couple of measures uh, for jumps that might have been caused by the labor reforms. There was one in February 2010, there was another one in, uh, uh, no, sorry, it's June 2010 and February 2012. Okay, so we're controlling like steps in the hazard there, both in employment and in unemployment. Uh, and uh, again, we use this, this survey, we distinguish between recession, 2001, 2007, sorry, expansion, so the, the big boom, and recession slash recovery, because the last two years, well, actually the last year was a recovery. Uh, and we have hundreds of thousands of uh, observations, uh, fortunately. So things are very tightly estimated. And I'm going to show you hazards, that's, that's like logs. Uh, it's very hard to think in terms of hazards. I've never managed to do that uh, even trying for decades. So I'm going to show you the accumulation of the hazards, which is the survival rate. So probability that uh, the person is still unemployed after X months. Uh, so this one uh, piece of evidence, which as, as I said is technically disputed, is this uh, uh, duration dependence. This is how the average hazard evolves over time. So it's very, well, it's high. It's uh, like 20 something percent at the beginning. Then it really falls and it becomes very low. And this is plotted against uh, the hazard of living at six months, which is about 0.10. This would be the monthly hazard, okay? Uh, and then the average of the full period, the three years, which is lower, is more like uh, 0.7, so it's 7% uh, per month. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, if we are really capturing properly duration dependence, this is really large. Uh, I'll give you a few numbers uh, later on. So this is, uh, I guess, the most important table in uh, in my presentation today. So let me walk you through a few characteristics that make it more likely that people will become, will become long-term unemployed. So there are two columns here. Well, expansion, recession, and the difference. So you can see what difference the recession makes. And then within those periods, this is the probability that someone will still be unemployed after 12 months, conditional on you know, having been unemployed in all the periods before that. Uh, and this one is probability of, or rate of still being unemployed at uh, 24 months, but we are rescaling everything. So at, at 12 months, we shift this to one again, 100, and then we see probability of still being unemployed 12 months later, so at 24 months to make uh, these figures be more, uh, uh, you know, more easily understood. So, things to note. Well, the change from recession to, sorry, boom to recession, the probability really goes up, so doubles from 11 to 22, 
and uh, especially for the long-term unemployed, also almost doubles, and it's really hard, high, it's uh, 50%. Probability of, if you reach 12 months, reaching 24 months is amazingly high on overall. And then the main uh, characteristics that explain these uh, evolutions uh, are, well, benefits are really important. Let me focus on long-term unemployment, so this middle column. Uh, people without benefits, uh, their likelihood in the recession was 8%, jumps to 46%, so that's more than 40 points. That's really huge. Then other things, uh, skills are important, but uh, it's not that high, and it, actually there is this uh, uh, things that have been found in the literature as well, that uh, in, the, in our case, in the recession, it's actually lower for the medium skilled, is uh, is higher for is lower for the high skill, but the difference is like five points. So it's, compared to benefit, is really much much smaller. Uh, of course, allowing for measurement error in in what skill means. Uh, then uh, age is also very important. It's like 28 points. Experience is not that important from the median up, but if you really have very low experience, suppose you are young and. You've had, you've been having all this uh, terrible churning of very, very short-term employment, uh, temporary, temporary jobs where you know you're fired on Friday and hired again on Monday. Well, those are out, but we, as long as you are 15 days, we, we would be capture you here. Uh, then, really, the lower decile compared to the higher design is, is again sizable. And there are no big differences, surprisingly, at least for me. Uh, in, according to sector, although we do really see that uh, in construction it was eight and then it jumps to 21. But then the numbers here are all around 20, 20 something. Uh, so uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that the construction workers are now worse than the others. They are worse than they used to be. Okay, and then uh, these characteristics are similar when you look at 24 months. No, sometimes they become even bigger, sometimes they're lower, but uh, one thing we found here is that the same characteristics that make people become long-term unemployed are the ones that make it more likely that they will become very long-term unemployed. So there are no, we didn't find uh, big surprises here. Uh, and uh, other things to note, well, benefits seem to be more important, I mean, more than three times more important than the effect of the cycle. Uh, older workers, uh, I'm in that category, so I feel for these people. Uh, so say someone who is 30, 50 really has very low probability of leaving unemployment, so we have a, an important problem there. Uh, and uh, duration dependence, as I said, is, is, is quite important. I have some figures here this, uh, on the effect of benefits, but you can see they're very important for everyone, both in expansion and recession, and for females and males. And uh, this is the effect of benefits, uh, the cycle within uh, period, uh, age, and there are differences between uh, older people who remain unemployed longer than uh, younger people who really rotate, and uh, smaller differences due, uh, due to qualification. And the very last part, uh, I'm trying to leave a few minutes for questions. So, um, so we want to uh, try to convince you that uh, active labor market policies are important. Here we are going against the tide. Uh, the literature is uh, skeptical about these policies, but uh, there is some recent evidence now with uh, meta-analysis, recent one by Card, Kluwe, and Weber, and they find that really these policies are useful in re-employing workers, and they are actually more uh, useful in recessions than in booms. And uh, Surprisingly, uh, incentives for employment do seem to be useful and training as well, which is more expected. Whereas uh, 
job search assistance and orientation is important in the short term, then it tends to, to fade. Uh, and public employment has no effect. Uh, so, but one of the key messages here is that there is a composition in, in recessions, especially in deep recessions like this one, uh, the composition of uh, the unemployed changes, and that makes the policies more, more effective. That's our reading of the literature. In Spain, our record is really very poor, no matter what characteristic of our record you look at, and in particular, they're never evaluated, so it's actually uh, hard to, to point uh, to hard evidence on, on this lack of effects. So let me just conclude by uh, uh, mentioning the kind of policies we think would be useful. Uh, professional profiling, which is done in many countries, but it's not done here. Individual itineraries, which are in the law, but they're not implemented. Training programs that should correspond to local necessities. More voice for the workers themselves through vouchers. Uh, avoid really reliance on income support. And uh, so make really what is missing here is a strong link between benefits and active labor market policies. We think that private-public partnerships uh, would probably be better than just uh, the public offices uh, with you know, incentives for these private companies and proper and continuous evaluation. And we really have to move away from all these scandals that we've had where this money was pocketed by someone and there was actually, in many cases, even no training at all, okay? So it's not that we don't need to devote money to these policies. We need to do it, do it but uh, we do it well and with controls. And that's it. Thank you, someone. This is very timely uh, for the topic. Can they turn down these lights or turn up the lights in the audience? Oh, thanks. So we can see if someone has questions. And maybe turn this down a little bit, the ones that go to our eyes. Questions? You were so um, convincing, I guess. Antonio here. So th thanks for the presentation first. Um, so th the question I had is you've, you've said that there is a debate unsettled in the literature about uh, duration dependence versus heterogeneity. You didn't want to mojarte, but I'm asking you that <laughs> you... <laughs> que te mojes. Uh, especially because I, I have the feeling that this has an implication for policy. So in particular, that, that part I think is important. You should... Yes, you know. uh, you're absolutely right and I'm happy to, you know, take the plunge. Uh, yeah, I think there is duration dependence. Uh, uh, I did uh, some early work on, on this uh, with uh, Manuel Arellano and Olympia Bober many years ago. We found it. Uh, in this paper we've implemented... Uh, the most advanced techniques we could uh, implement and with uh, you know very big data set and we do find it so i uh, i'm not sure whether we're really estimating it perfectly probably not but uh, we again find it so i think it is there and it's very important because it does mean that uh, policies that really try to uh, help the unemployed early on uh, are going to be uh, very useful because then you prevent this buildup of the long-term unemployed and, and, when, and when they become long-term unemployed, it's much harder to, to, to help and to place and firms uh, will discriminate against them and they will become demoralized. So uh, for these reasons also, I think the duration dependence is there and uh, and so, yeah, for policy, uh, and we're doing exactly the opposite. You know, we people uh, are getting benefits. They're not uh, checked. They're not forced. They're not monitored. They're not helped. And therefore, when they start really looking for a job uh, uh, with a higher search effort, 
that's when it's harder to, to find a job for them. So, yeah, uh, I think this is crucial. And that's going to be a key message uh, in, the, in the paper. Okay, we have several. <laughs> Um, I think that very much connected to this, uh, I think one thing we are, we are seeing, we, now we are analyzing the whole unemployed in one of the regions of Spain, and one of the, the things we see is an unbelievable difference, something that you, you already said, between those pe people that get any benefit, either contributory or, or assistant, and those uh, people that don't get any benefit. So the exit rate from unemployment, even of those that are long-term unemployed, um, older than, than 45, if they don't get any money, they really get an exit from unemployment. I mean, the, the probability of getting out of unemployment is huge, even for those. So it seems to be the case that probably now wages are so low that if you get any assistance, uh, the better for you is not to exit unemployment. So it is true that I think we have to really get into this. It is that probably at this stage, um, the opportunity cost of getting into a job is, are very, is very low because wages, probably the wages you are going to receive are so low mm. that it's better to, to stay unemployed if you get any benefit, even if it's assistant benefit. Don't you think that there is something like this? in? Well, we were really worried about uh, this issue. That's why we wanted to look at it from different perspectives, and that, that explained the whole uh, sequence of uh, data sets and questions we've looked at. Uh, so looking at the quality, which doesn't seem to be that uh, important, then looking at uh, the behavior of observation wages, and, and this seems to confirm what you found. And, and in the hazard models, you still find significant uh, interactions of duration with benefits uh, after 12 months and even after 24 months, although at 24 months they, they, they do revert, but they already is more. So, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the, the returns from going back to the market are low, but then uh, you are, um, the unemployed might, might be making them even lower than themselves with their own behavior. And therefore, in the recession there was not much that we could do, but because the jobs were not there. But now we are in a recovery. Employment is growing really fast, 3%, something like that, uh, in tune with, with, with GDP. So productivity is uh, not recovering, but uh, let's think about that in future. Uh, so uh, now the jobs are there. So we need to uh, really uh, help and incentive, incentivate people to, to go back. Yeah. Juan. Yeah. No. Uh it's also related to this. Looking at the aggregate numbers, it seems that long-term unemployment is a much bigger problem now than in previous recessions, right? Uh, but uh, I wonder if controlling for the composition of the unemployed and the aggregate demand and so on, duration dependence is now yeah. a bigger problem than in the past. I mean, in your table, table four, I remember, uh, you compare mm -hmm. hazard rates between expansion and recessions, I think it would be a good exercise to compare with previous recessions to see if now the problem is uh, bigger, uh, more pressing that, than in the past. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, okay, so uh, you caught me. This is in the to-do list and we will certainly look at that. Uh, and I will report to you personally. And uh, <laughs> beyond that, uh, we are going to hopefully submit the paper to Ceres, the Journal of the Spanish Economic Association. The editors are really tough, so I'm not sure they will uh, take it. But if they do, uh, you will also see it there, uh, hopefully, within next year. More questions? I don't see any, any, so I think it's time for lunch. Thank well, you very let me, much. Let me just say that yes, uh, we'll also publicize the answer because it's so important in our Twitter and Facebook accounts of the association. So uh, join us. Thank you. <laughs>